when was the last time that you played? Some of you might have uh, been on the subway today playing a game on your phones. Others might play board games at home with your kids or with your, um, w- with your spouse. Uh, some of you might be in some sort of a sports league, like a soccer league or a volleyball league or something like that. Play encompasses all of these things. Play isn't just limited to, to, to video games or to, to an actual game. Play is what we do when we're not concerned with our everyday survival. We do it for enjoyment, and play is essential to, to who we are. And what we do at the Institute of Play is we design experiences that make learning irresistible. And at the core, at the center of all of those learning experiences is a game or game-like experiences that underlies this whole thing, that gives teachers and students a need to know, a reason to know more, a desire to continue to learn. When I was a teacher, these were the skills that I wanted my students to leave my classroom with. If they didn't know every little thing about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, okay, I wanted that too, but I wanted them to be thinkers, to be creative, to solve problems, to communicate with one another, to collaborate. I wanted them to be great adults and great people. So at the Institute of Play, we thought about how play connects to those skills and how it fosters those skills. And we looked at the best games in the world. You were an active participant in the learning. Where in a classroom, it felt like fun. It didn't just feel like you were going to school. Where you learned by actually doing stuff and you could make a connection between what you were learning and what was happening in the outside world. Where you could understand exactly how you were doing in that class in a moment rather than three weeks after you handed in a test and you get your grade back. Or you get a report card at the end of the semester you know immediately where your class is constantly challenging and where you know it's okay to fail because you can reiterate and you can redesign. That's a powerful classroom. Why would we ever ask students to move through a process and to own a process if we as teachers don't understand that process ourselves? It is so essential. For anybody who knows the design process, you know that the very first step in the design process is to empathize, is to put yourselves in the role of the person you're designing for. In the TeacherQuest program, we actually have a group of students from maybe a nearby school come in and play test the games that the teachers have created. That is so essential. How many times have you taught a lesson that you never tested out before? I know I used to do that all the time. I would sit at home, oftentimes on like a Sunday, and be writing and think it's going to be amazing, and then I go to um, show it to my students, and it sometimes would be a disaster. When you're doing this in a classroom, you build expectations and structures around expectations for gameplay. People always ask, well, this looks great, but can I do this with a class of, of kids who misbehave? Yeah, of course you can. This doesn't solve all the behavior problems, by the way. You actually have to build a lot of good structures in your classroom. But every teacher's first step towards excellent classroom behavior is a lesson that engages. And so you have to use these in combination with one another. Don't think of games as simply a, um, digital or non-digital. You can blend them together. You can use both. And finally, when you're picking a game or designing a game, really think of its potential for, lear- um, for learning, for engagement. Think about what those learning goals can be and play test them on your students. Test them out first. 